What's up everybody, this is Felix, and in this tutorial, as we said, we're going to be actually building our state machine, which is this guy right here. And in the last tutorial, we set up a truth table, like this, and we got all of our Boolean expressions for each of the different outputs that we have which are three LEDs and our two next state bits. So when we go to build this guy, let's just build it in here right now for simplicity. Looking at our, our uh, diagram, we're going to have a, the button that's coming in is an input. We've got two bits of current state, uh, or two, bit, two bits of memory, rather, which indicate the current state. Come over here, and let's build these bits of memory. Just two bits, and we'll call it CS for current state, and then we also want to add a next state, and the reason that these are different is slightly complicated, but it comes down to timing issues in inside the FPGA, in that our logic, which is going to be executed, these different logic blocks, they don't execute instantaneously. So what we see is actually something like this. So here's our, our clock. And what we want is whenever the clock ticks, we want all of our outputs to update. And what happens here when we push the button in it doesn't instantaneously figure out what the next state is. If you, if you look at our equation for NS0, it has to calculate this. It has to run all of the circuitry, and that takes time. Now, it's a very small time, but it takes time, and it's not instantaneous. So as these things are adjusting, you get something that looks like this. It kind of is unstable for a minute before it finally settles on its final value. And this section right here is called contamination delay because it's just very unstable. You don't know what it's going to be until it finishes, after some amount of time, all of the logic that we're running here. So to get around this, Rather than just hooking up our next state, here, let's do this. So here is your, your next state. If this is the output and that gets saved right in here directly, then you're going to have this really wonky signal going back in as the input and now your circuit is going to get all confused because it's changing and you're probably going to get a wrong value. So that's not what we want. We want to make sure that it's a very clean signal like this. So what we do is we set a second register that will take on the, the value of all of this logic and then when the clock ticks we assign the value of this register next state into current state and see that ensures a nice clean signal just by using a second register and then saving the first register into the second register at the clock tick so that's that's why we've got a next state and a current state. 
Next state is like the raw output from the signal, the, the logic, and then we're saving that once it settles down at the clock tick into your actual memory. Okay. So with that being said, here's current state and next state. And then we also have our button. Now in the in the last tutorial, I had it hooked up to the reset button. And uh, what I forgot is when I ran this, I realized, oh yeah, we can't hook up the reset button as a regular button. Uh, you can you can wire LEDs to it like we've done before, but you can't use it as a button because it clears out all the registers when you reset it. So what we actually need to do is uh, instead of using reset as an input, we need to just, we'll call it button. Add that guy back in there. And we'll just re-paste this in there. Okay. So now we should have our real, or we should have the same expressions, but it'll just say a button instead. So let's go create this button. We're going to have to hook up an external button uh, to get around using the reset button. And if you recall, we go down here into constraints, and then we see all of our pin setup in here. So we'll make a new one. We'll just copy this and call it button and you can pick any pin that's not being used I'm going to just use pin 50 and then we can go down here and add input button and now we can access our button All right. So now we have our registers, they're going in there. We have our input, which is a button. Now we need to set our outputs. So we are going to be using the LEDs, but again, because of this timing issue, we're going to need to have registers. We need to have two sets of registers to handle the outputs and then those registers will get hooked up to the LEDs. So we just need two bits because or three bits because we have three LEDs and we'll name these guys T and L temporary and the one that's going to get hooked up to the LEDs. And now that we've got our inputs and outputs and the memory all hooked up, we can do the combinational logic. That's the, the parts that are going to be here. And then do the synchronous logic to transfer those transfer those combinational values into our synchronous registers. So let's get into a combinational block. And uh, start with our first temporary register. That's going to be the one that corresponds to LED 0, and we'll use our little arrow operator to indicate non-blocking or parallel assignment of all of these. And let's go over here and grab him, paste him in there, and now we have to convert it to Verilog syntax. 
what Lodge Sim will give you plus is an or, and then we'll put parentheses around these two guys, and then these spaces are ands. Now we'll put brackets around these numbers. These are the indices of our actual registers, which are up here, and then semicolon. Cool. So that is the first temporary register for LED 1. Okay, so here we've got all of our three temporary LED registers logic up. And now we'll just do the next state registers. All right, I've got all of these typed out. All the logic is hooked up to all of the temporary LEDs and the temporary state, the next state registers. So what that will do is this stuff always happen. So as soon as we push the button, these are updating to their new values. And what we want to do now, uh, what we want to do next is when the clock hits a positive edge, when it ticks, we want to take these values and put them into the real ones. So we use our always pause edge And this is just really easy. All we do is we say store T in L. That'll put the temporary into the actual LED register. Uh, they're not the LEDs, but it's the one we're going to use to hook up to the LEDs. And then we'll put NS into CS and that'll put that'll make the current state officially saved when the clock ticks and one last thing that we're gonna do is hook up the L to the actual LEDs we'll go back down here to our generate space to do that So let's get the first three LEDs, and we'll assign them to L. All right. Don't forget to change this guy down here so that he's not assigning the LEDs twice. And one more gotcha that we're going to have to worry about. Since we're using user input uh, by them, like actually physically pushing a button, and this clock is running at 50 megahertz, when we push that button, this is going to run so many times. It'll probably run hundreds of times, maybe even thousands of times, before you can possibly lift your finger back up off the button. So we need to make this clock slower at a more human reaction pace. So how about we just bring in our 1 hertz clock again. We'll just go import it from our last project. Now we've got a slow clock module in here. I'll come up here and make one. Don't forget we need to make a clock one hertz wire. And now we can make this clock be the clock one hertz. All right, so what should be happening is all of our logic here is always running. 
that's this part here. As soon as you push the button, it goes and it settles on a value. And then when you release it, it kind of there's a little bit of static before it finally settles back out at the value it should be. And then when the clock ticks, we store the temporary value into the value that we want to use into the register we're using and then we hook up the good register to the LEDs and all of this is using an external button that we hooked up and we defined over here so with all of that in place let's try building it All right, here we go. We'll upload it. You can see I hooked up a, a button here, and it's going into the plus V pin, and then the pin 50 pin right next to it. And when we press this, we'll hold it down for a little bit until the clock ticks, and look, LED 1 turned on. If I press it again until the clock ticks, it goes to LED 2, LED 3, it goes back to zero. And then, of course, if we hold the button down, every time the clock ticks, it cycles through to the next state in our diagram, just like this. Well, congratulations. You have built your first state machine on an FPGA. Again, these are super super common and very fundamental for building all kinds of computational circuitry and and all sorts of things. Now all of this is starting to get fairly complicated so it would be a real shame if we did all of this work and then it didn't behave the way we wanted. So in the next few tutorials we're going to start talking about running simulations on the computer and that allows you to, to actually monitor all of the individual registers and things to make sure that it's behaving exactly how you expect. Uh, that's really helpful for bug catching so stick around.